Hi, my name is Ashley Sher. I'm the founder and CEO of Sher Love Finds. Today we're exploring the sutras of Patanjali. We're going to look at Sutra 2.47. That is Book 2, Sutra 47 of Book 2. 2.47 of the sutras of Patanjali reads in English as follows. By lessening the natural tendency for restlessness and by meditating on the infinite, posture is mastered. Because the senses want to taste many things, we load the system with toxins. Instead, we should control these things. Also, we can achieve steadiness through meditation on the infinite. Anything great, huge, well settled and well established, tiny things always shake. So we can think of the earth, of how steady a huge mountain is. In the Hindu tradition, the devotee thinks of a thousand hooded serpent, and it's said to carry the world on its head. If you take this image literally, it seems like foolishness. But this cobra stands for the gravitational force, the vital force. The force is represented by a cobra since it's believed that the cobra can live mainly on air. But we can think of anything according to our traditions and beliefs. New Yorkers, where Cher Lafund is um, founded, can think of the Empire State Building, of its great foundation, or the Statue of Liberty, and how steady and firm it must be to carry over a hundred stories. A European might say, I will think of the Rock of Gibraltar, or we can imagine the statues or dead bodies. If the body is still, it can easily make the mind still. One of my matters is to look at ancient yogic thought and think, how can we apply this today? One master used to say, you need not repeat any prayers. Just sit quietly for three hours in a row with no movement whatsoever without even winking then everything will be accomplished easily if we sit for that long the mind comes under control automatically though the body through sorry through the body we can put a break on the mind the mind will always think it's time for the movies. I want to get up and go. Or I'm hungry, I wanna eat something. But if we decide I'm not moving for three hours, the mind ultimately has to obey us because it needs the body's cooperation in order to get anything. That is the benefit of asana or the accomplishment of asana. There are other kinds of ways to control the mind. We can use eating or restricting eating, fasting to control the mind. You restrict yourself to eating just a certain amount of food at a certain time of day. Limiting your movement by taking a vow, such as I won't move out of this apartment for one year, or I will not leave Manhattan for a year and a half. Probably the next day, someone will offer you a free ticket to California. Tests tend to come immediately. This is a test of mental resolve, making a commitment, making a vow. I'm going to work out every day, even if it's for five minutes. The moment you make that vow, something will happen. Oh, my wrist hurts, I can't work out. That's the test. 
We have all experienced this. The moment we decide to fast, a friend will bring us something delicious to eat. It makes us feel very sad. Just today I decided to fast and you brought this delicious cake for me. How can um, I refuse it? And then we fail. We, we fail our exam. We lose our resolve. When we take a vow, we should stick to it. There will be ample tests to test us to break it. So sometimes by gaining perspective, it helps us be our best self. So if you decide to take a vow, for example, to not eat sugar, and then a friend comes and rings your doorbell and says, oh, I made um, cupcakes and here are some for you. If you think of yourself as just um, part of this world and that this world is all there is, then it's easy to say, oh, you know what? I'll not eat sugar starting tomorrow and I'll enjoy these cupcakes. However, alternatively, if you think of us as sort of being tested on a mission to be our best self. And if you make a vow and then somebody rings a doorbell and tempts you, it's almost easier to say no because you're not thinking about it like it's just one cupcake. You're thinking about it like, do you wanna pass this test or not? And that is a way to stop thinking about the immediate gratification and start thinking about your integrity. So I don't mean to say this hypocritically. Uh, I just as much struggle with this as much as everyone else or more. Uh, when I explore these texts with students, uh, it is an academic exercise. It is not uh, saying that I've mastered it personally in any way. It's just, um, saying that it's interesting to examine these texts and to use these texts to stimulate our own personal thought and critical thinking so that we may become the best version of ourselves. In Hindu philosophy, specifically in South India, there are 63 saints who realize truth by taking just one vow and sticking to it, even at the cost of their lives. And by no means am I advocating that um, anybody um, hurt their life, um, but this is just a review of ancient yogic philosophy. One of, for one of them, the king vowed, if I see holy ash on my forehead, I will treat the bearer as the Lord and give him all that he asks for. After a while, a test came. His enemy, another king, came to know of his vow. He dressed himself as a philosophy teacher, smeared ash on his forehead, and took a sharp dagger covered with a nice cloth and went to the palace. When he arrived, he asked the gatekeeper, can I see the king? As he was ushered in, the king's minister asked for his credentials. I have come with a special scripture for the king because I am a teacher of philosophy. But the minister had some doubts. He thought he recognized the man, but he had been ordered by the king to bring in anyone with holy ash on his forehead. As he did so, he told the king, I have my doubts about this man. I think he might be your sworn enemy. I see the holy ash on his forehead, replied the king. He is Lord and he has come to teach me some scripture. Let me learn from him. Turning to his disguised enemy, he said, Please take your seat. The other king said, This is a very holy scripture, very sacred and secret 
and it should only be taught to the proper student. You are that person. Your minister is not qualified to hear it. He should leave. As the king was dismissing him, his minister asked, do you really want me to go? Yes, you must, said the king. So he was forced to leave. The king bowed before his supposed teacher, and as he did so, he was stabbed with his enemy's dagger. When the king yelled in pain, his minister rushed back in with his sword drawn. The king said, Minister, he is my lord. Don't do anything to him. No one, let no one in the country harm him. Take him away safely. With the holy name of Lord on his lips, the king fell dead. With his last breath, he had the vision of God. This is um, an ancient story. The rest of the 63 saints invariably have their realization at the cost of their lives too. The idea of these stories is that um, to basically um, create situations where someone takes a vow and to really try to drill in the point to the people that you should never, ever, ever break the vow. And if people are like, oh, but somebody brought me cupcakes, so I should break the sugar vow. The point of these 63 stories is saying, well, this king didn't break the vow at the cost of his life. This other saint didn't break the vow at the cost of this his life and giving 63 stories of people who kept vows at the cost of their own life helps us drill in the point that there is no exceptions and we should keep vows. So again, when I um, talk about this, I'm not, um, you know, I'm a person just like everybody else trying to go through um, the daily uh, trials and tribulations. So this is um, something that we can all work with at different levels. Some of us are better at vows than others. Um, and this is um, an ultimate goal of attainment. The idea behind this is taking one vow and sticking to it so that we become masters of our minds. We don't give in to them with leniency. Once we make a vow, we should stick to it unwaveringly. Traditional Hindu marriages are made of this simple principle. Once a life partner is taken by somebody, the wife becomes a goddess to the husband and a god to her. If one partner dies, the other lives in memory of that person. As they are never to marry again. Although the husband may be a drunkard, a devil, the wife will say he is my Lord. God gave him to me. Whatever he is, I will accept it. This is a great austerity. A proverb concerning it goes, he may be a rock, he may be grass, but he is still my husband. The wife says, let me adapt, adjust, accommodate. Let me live with him. By their own faith in the Lord, many women have converted rogue husbands into true saints. Namaste.